Good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's webcast, PCI Breach Scenarios and the Cyber Threat Landscape. I'm Melanie Jewell, Marketing Manager at Tripwire, and I'm excited to be moderating this presentation today. Before we start, I'd like to go over a couple of housekeeping items. Please make sure that your audio is streaming correctly. Please note that the audio portion will stream through your PC or laptop speakers. Be sure to check your speaker volume, the volume setting on your computer, and your headset to ensure that it is turned on and the volume is at an audible level. Today's webcast is presented using a slide deck. You can click on the expand rectangle on the right top corner of the slide area to enlarge. If you are not seeing the slide movement in your console, you can try refreshing your browser. If you have any technical difficulties, please click on the help widget. It is the question mark icon on your console and covers common technical issues. If you have a question for our presenters, you can click on the Q&A widget at the bottom and submit your question. question. We will have a Q&A session at the end of the presentation. We will also be running a couple of polls during today's presentation and we encourage everybody to take part. Lastly, I will be sending out a link to the on-demand version of this webcast and a link to the slides. Now let's get on with the presentation. Our first presenter today is Brian Honan, an award-winning independent security consultant, speaker and author based in Dublin, Ireland. Brian is the founder and head of the Iris Cert, Ireland's first com computer emergency response team, and is a special advisor to Europol's Cybercrime Centre, EC3. He is joined today by Tripwire's very own Irfan Kimji, a senior security engineer who brings a wealth of experience providing technical security leadership to many Fortune 500 companies. To see their full bios, click on the bio widget at the bottom of your screen. Welcome, gentlemen. So now, without further delay, I'll turn it over to Brian Honan. Take it away, Brian. Hi, Melanie. Thank you, and uh, good morning to everybody. Thanks for joining us this morning. So, yeah, I'm looking forward to this uh, uh, webinar. I think it's actually very timely. Anybody who was looking at their uh, news inputs over the over the, the night may see that Verizon actually uh, published their 2015 Verizon PCI compliance report. So, uh, a very timely webinar to match up with the uh, timely uh, release of that report. So, if uh, you haven't read that report yet, and I appreciate that it's only a few hours since some of us may have seen it. Uh, I would encourage you to have a look at it uh, later on today. Some of the key takeaways from that report actually that we've looked at and, and it will touch upon a lot of the areas we're going to go through today uh, with myself and Irvan is that uh, Verizon's report stated that 80% of businesses fail their interim PCI compliance assessment. So, you know, once you have your compliance got and then you have to move forward, you know, this is something that you, you continuously have to work on compliance and maintain it. So those of you who are, are compliant or looking to be compliant soon, uh, keep that in mind that from, uh, in, in, in a few months from, from now, you still have to be keeping yourself compliant as well. And that is a problem. Uh, you know, Two-thirds of companies, the report said as well, that within a year of being compliant, they, they've fallen out of compliance. So, it, it, it is a challenge to, 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 to keep going, as, going with it. But anyway, we will push on the, the presentation. What we will try and do is to help you achieve that compliance and ongoing compliance is to uh, give you an understanding of where we've seen some of the major PCI breach scenarios. Talk about the cyber threat landscape as I've seen it and bring you in some uh, feedback and, and I suppose war stories from uh, my working with the CERT and uh, getting, uh, you know, what's, what's happening out there. And let's talk about some of the resources available, and Ervan will be uh, quite uh, uh, able to help you there and sort of talk about what, what tools, what techniques and technologies can help uh, achieve those. 
So what we're going to go through is the whole area of the background and context with regards to uh, PCI compliance and I suppose what the threat landscape is out there that, 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 that's impacting us as well. So Europol in their series Organized Crime Threat Assessment for 2013 highlights a statistic that I think is quite uh, interesting. I know it's been bandied about quite a bit, but it did highlight that uh, cybercrime globally has a figure of $3 trillion, uh, which if you compare that to the drug uh, industry, and uh, it's, it, it's, it's actually bigger. Than, than the drugs industry. And I think if you put that in context, that is something that we need to uh, digest and, and, and look at. And, and the resources being put into fight drugs and illegal drugs, you know, they, unfortunately, they don't match what we're trying to do against cybercrime. So we, we do have a bit of a, a catching up to do uh, uh, in that regard. And I suppose the key messages I've seen are the key changes I've seen the past year to 18 months, and it's backed up by this report from IBM, is that cyber security, IT security, information security, whatever label you want to put on it, it is no longer an IT problem. Traditionally, it's been an IT problem. It's been assigned or, or uh, uh, allocated out to the IT department to look after. But uh, in my experience, I'm seeing the audience I'm dealing with in business now uh, is changing. Five years ago, it would very much be the CIO, uh, IT manager, head of IT, or head of security that would be bringing me in to talk to them about security. Now I'm in, I'm talking to CEOs, CFOs, uh, even board of directors. Just two weeks ago, two weeks ago, I was in uh, talking to the board of directors for one of our banks here in Ireland and talked to them about the cybercrime landscape and the challenges that they face and that they should be, be considering as well. So it is changing and uh, it is something to take into account. Uh, and just to back up what we're talking about, I just want to talk about some of the PCI-related security events that we have seen over the previous uh, few months and what the maybe you know lessons we can learn from them as well. And I think this is a an interesting sign. If you, if you can see that on the screen, the sign reads, please do not log on to your PC equipment or company Wi-Fi until further notice. That is a sign that greeted employees of Sony Pictures Entertainment when they came into work in November of last year, where their network was completely compromised and all systems, workstation servers, etc., were uh, infected with, with, with malware. Uh, lots of data had been um, uh, extra, extracted from the company, uh, reports stating that over 100 terabytes of information had been stolen, uh, including uh, movies, scripts, email transcripts, uh, personal records uh, uh, and health records of employees, and also credit card data of uh, some customers as well, uh, which is something that ha didn't really hit the headlines. Uh, the headlines focusing on the, the that infamous the interview movie and uh, 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 allegedly North Korea's involvement. But you know, let's not forget there was all information that was compromised, and that part of that was uh, uh, PCI uh, related data, such as credit card data. Now we still are not aware, or, or don't know what the root cause of that attack was. Uh, from what I'm hearing, it's the, the, the evidence seems to be pointing towards a spear phishing email that uh, delivered malware onto a, an employee's uh, laptop, um, and that allowed uh, the criminals to, to have uh, further access to the network. Other theories are that it was an employee, internal employee uh, taking information in and out via USB stick and infections that way. So we don't yet know what causes, but I think you know we can we can still learn a lot from that breach as well. Other breaches to take that hit the headlines have been the infamous Target breach just over a year ago, where over 100 million credit card details were stolen, and that ended up uh, raising a lot of eyebrows because, as a result of that, not only did the CIO uh, resign, but the CEO uh, of Target resigned as well. Um, and looking in at that security breach, the the breach was due to malware being installed on the point of sale devices. Uh, within various stores uh, throughout Target. But how the criminals actually got into that into Target's network, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't a direct attack against Target per se. It was an attack against the um, air conditioning, the, the uh, HVAC 
uh, vendor that Target uses to, to manage and monitor the, the fridges and freezers uh, in the stores, obviously a, a, a critical thing for the stores to make sure that uh, anything, if any of those systems fail, that the vendor can go out and fix straight away. But uh, that vendor had direct access into Target's network. Uh, the criminals broke into the vendor's uh, network. From the vendor's network, they were able to piggyback through that connection into Target's network. And then via Target's network, they're able to access the point of sales environment as well. I think that's maybe a lesson for us to learn that similar to many other large organizations, our IT infrastructure has evolved rather than being designed from, from green fields. And there are a lot of, uh, you know, crossovers and networks and they may not be fully segmented so that, you know, your, your, Third-party vendors maybe once once they get onto your network, may be able to access other systems on your network. That's something to to, to consider. Um, similarly, with the the Home Depot network, it, it looks like one of their third-party suppliers was compromised, and from there, that they uh, uh, were able to get onto the point of sale to the systems as well. Uh, and again, a similar story. Staples, uh, UPS. Uh, that was from uh, quite a while, uh, more than uh, about 18 months ago. And interestingly, at that time, what happened was the uh, point of sale systems were attacked in UPS as well. But interesting enough, at that stage, data, credit card data was being was sent unencrypted across the network uh, internally within UPS, which allowed the criminals to intercept the traffic as well. So some, some key lessons to to, to be learned there as well. And I know given the time of day we're at and uh, you know that we're probably predominantly a UK uh, European audience. Uh, so you know I think the key message I want to give today and this morning is that yes we've talked about Target and UPS and Home Depot and the big headline stories with regard to credit card breaches do tend to focus on US business and uh, but I don't believe that is an indication that U.S. businesses are any less secure than European or all the businesses elsewhere, or that we're doing a much better job. Uh, a key thing to consider, of course, is the fact that we use chip and pin in Europe, uh, which reduces the, uh, I suppose, the likelihood of, uh, of using credit cards in card present fraud. Uh, that's where you hand the card over the counter. But uh, using chip and pin has increased card not present fraud. So we still have a lot of issues to, to consider. And for this presentation, we actually spent some interesting time doing research on trying to figure out where have there been some European-based credit card breaches. Because remember, we don't have mandatory, credit, uh, mand mandatory data breach notifications uh, in Europe. So breaches can happen. They may not be public and therefore we, we don't hear about it. Just because we don't hear about it doesn't mean that they're not happening. So some examples that I've come across are, uh, the first one there, it's actually an Irish company. So uh, well done to Ireland for leading the way. <laughs> uh, but Lyle to Build is a company on the west coast of Ireland, and it provides uh, services to, to other companies to support their loyalty card programs. So you sign up for a loyalty card. Uh, some of the companies that loyalty card supported were as uh, uh, Stena Sea Lines, uh, Stat Oil, uh, and a, super, uh, a supermarket chain here in Ireland called Super Value. Uh, they had a security breach back in November 2013 where it, hackers broke into their network and stole their database. It turned out over 1 million credit card details were stored. Some of the key lessons from that attack were that uh, the uh, attackers got in through the web platform that the loyalty bill were using. It was an out of date version of Cold Fusion, the Cold Fusion platform, so it hadn't been updated with the with the, the latest security uh, patches or anything else either. Uh, the database they stored the credit card details in was not encrypted, plus they'd encrypt, they, they had credit card details stored from about two or three years previously. So lots of uh, uh, issues there that uh, hopefully uh, other companies aren't uh, following. TK Maxx, uh, they, they are actually, is, that's the uh, European version of TJX, the infamous TJX hack from back in 2005 where over 50 million credit card details were stolen. Uh, if you used your credit cards or your debit card in stores throughout uh, Ireland, UK, or any other place in Europe, that you 
your data was sent back to the U.S. and was compromised in that security breach as well. Again, because we don't have mandatory disclosure laws here in Europe, no uh, European customers were, were, not, were not notified about it. Uh, the other one there is Zurich, uh, the uh, UK insurance company. They lost credit card data when sending uh, unencrypted uh, backup tapes down to their South African uh, data center. Uh, those tapes went missing with credit card data along the way. Um, some other examples from Europe include the uh, Landesbank Berlin uh, 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 back in 2008. They had a security breach. I don't have the full details of, of how the, the, the breach happened, but I let this credit card data has been exposed. Uh, similarly, a company in Helsinki had a security breach with over 100,000 credit card details uh, being exposed as well. And uh, Stay Sure, which is a UK uh, credit card, uh, sorry, UK insurance company, they had a security breach for uh, nearly 100,000 people's uh, credit card details were, 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 were stolen, and they ended up getting fined by the Information uh, Commissioner's Office in the UK because of inadequate security to protect that data. Uh, so even like it, there was a double whammy there, not only uh, have they to worry about PCI, but also uh, data protection as well. And then CEC Bank in uh, Romania, they had credit card data exposed uh, accidentally on their website by an employee uh, uploading the information to the website incorrectly. So that kind of gives you a feel, hopefully, that you know, credit card theft is happening worldwide just because we don't have big headlines highlighting uh, non-U.S. breaches. It doesn't necessarily mean it's not happening elsewhere, so uh, we do need to focus on this particular area as well. And, you know, in case you're wondering, this is what happens with credit card data. This is a screenshot. Uh, it is actually a bit out of date now, uh, but it's a screenshot from uh, an underground forum where uh, credit card data is bought and sold. So if you take that loyalty bill uh, breach, uh, it's believe that the attackers who stole those credit card details would not have the skills or the ability to uh, cash out or, uh, or, or make money from those credit card details, so they would sell them on an underground forum. So even if the criminals don't directly use the credit card d d data, it does have value to them. So uh, you can see there from the screen that uh, you can buy credit card data uh, in bulk for at that particular time for one dollar eighty per U.S. Uh, and that's for U.S.-based credit cards. Uh, UK, European credit cards, their prices at those days and, and at that time fell between five dollars to ten dollars per per credit card, uh, uh, because of the chip and pin uh, uh, information. Uh, on the on the UK credit cards, so the, the point there though is that you know even if criminals don't directly use credit card data, it still has value to them. They can they can buy and sell on these underground uh, forums, and they're similar to the eBay's or any other online auction sites we we may use ourselves. You can rate criminals being uh, as a a good seller or a bad seller, or that they sell good data or buy sad data, uh, buy bad data, or they they pay up. Uh, so. Um, uh, that's a, an example of where that information can be uh, used and abused. So based on that, uh, what we'd like to do is just do a quick survey question here. And you know, if you could take a few seconds just to, to, to look at the question there and let us know, how long would it take you to detect a cyber attack on a critical system in scope for PCI? Would it be less than 24 hours? Uh, would it take you 25 hours to 72 hours? Would it be within less than one week or less than one month? Uh, uh, not confident at all in your ability to detect a cyber attack. So uh, if you can have a look at those, let us know what, for, what you think uh, your answers are, and uh, uh, we would be interested to see the results. And later on, Irfan is going to be talking about some of the data from the uh, 2014 Verizon Data Breach Investigation Report, another very great report from uh, uh, Verizon, and it basically to compare your results uh, with that. So I'll just give you one or two, uh, a few seconds to, to answer that, and then we'll, we'll move on to, to, to the next part of the, the, the presentation.
Yeah, Brian, that's, that's some interesting stuff. I wonder what, what kind of the difference would be, be or how some of those executives from, from the companies that were breached, what their thoughts on this would be before uh, and, and actually seeing the actual results after they were breached to see how long it did actually yeah, take. Yeah, do you, uh, do you know, Ivana, it's probably a survey we could never get done, but I'd love to see this survey done from executives in those companies we just had that have been breached to see what their uh, answers would be to this and then compare it with their answers after they've been breached. <laughs> you know, yeah, maybe, you know, uh, if, if you're answering this thinking, yes, less than 24 hours, well, maybe the key thing to do after this presentation is go back, go and just maybe do, double check and make sure that, 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 that you, you can answer uh, or can respond within the time you actually think. <laughs> so there's right. interesting. So less than 24 hours, 28% of you say it will take you uh, less than 24 hours to do it. That's very good. Uh, so. I suppose two key takeaways there is that one third of you are not confident that you could detect a cyber attack, which obviously is a, is a worrying um, uh, statistic. Uh, yes, nearly half of you say that you would be confident uh, to do it within within three days. So, uh, uh, Vincent Irfan, to come uh, compare those with the figures later on in the presentation. <laughs> um, so. Where are these attacks coming from, and uh, what, you know, what, what has been compromised? So, I suppose first of all, we do have to consider the atypical, stereotypical hacker. This is when most people think about a hacker. This is what we probably think of: is a disgruntled or a disaffected teenager stuck in a basement somewhere, surrounded by uh, heavy metal music, no friends, no girlfriends, you know. That is the typical uh, view of a hacker, and then in some cases it's true, but in a lot of cases it's not. Uh, but yes, they are still a threat. There are still lots of people out there who are looking to attack systems just from uh, a curiosity or a, a, an entertainment point of view. So, so they're still there. We also have the bad apple, the insider threat. This is where an employee may accidentally disclose information such as that bank in, in, in the CEC bank in Romania accidentally posting information up onto a website. I know one of my clients, uh, their, their email filtering system discovered one of their staff emailing uh, 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 an Excel spreadsheet with credit card data in the Excel spreadsheet to their personal email address so they could work on the spreadsheet over the weekend for a report they had to have ready uh, for, for the following week, uh, looking up their DLP system uh, triggered and, and, and blocked the email going out. But there was nothing malicious being done by these staff. They were just trying to do their, in their mind, trying to do their job. but accidentally uh, expose information. Uh, the other issue then, of course, is the uh, maybe the disgruntled employee or the coerced employee by criminal gangs who may be you know, off of bribes or maybe blackmailed in some way to uh, work on the behest of criminals, maybe uh, stealing information on USB keys, inserting uh, key loggers into devices, downloading malware or whatever. or Staff would be social engineered by criminals to click on a link or an attachment in the email. So these are all the uh, ways the insider can be uh, uh, used or abused uh, as well. This is where we see the bigger problem, though, coming from. This is organized crime. This is a, a Romanian police erect, uh, arresting a number of cyber criminals, um, and you know it is becoming much more attractive for for for, cyber, for criminals to be involved in cyber crime because it's. Uh, it's low risk, it's high profit, uh, you're not likely to get shot while you're sitting at a keyboard, or, uh, uh, or, and it's, it's cross-jurisdiction making it difficult for law enforcement to, to, to chase down. So uh, they are getting more involved and more organized and, uh, and clever at what they do. But thankfully so are uh, law enforcement as well, uh, and hopefully we'll, we'll, we'll continue that way. Uh, the other area in, then is, is online activists. The most infamous of them are famous, depending on your point of view, would be uh, anonymous. And you know, in the past, they've attacked companies like uh, Sony, uh, who, who seem to be poor, uh, unfortunate of online attacks. But back in uh, two or three years ago, Sony's PlayStation network was breached. The credit card details of subscribers was were also leaked onto the internet uh, to 
teach Sony a lesson in how insecure the networks were. But, you know, anonymous weren't using them to doubt those credit card details for their own financial gain, but to embarrass the company. Your company could also be targeted by uh, activists, be they, uh, you know, from, from, from whatever background they, they may be. And one way to do that would be to expose your information as well. And I suppose, you know, Edward Snowden and the revelation in The Guardian and other newspapers as well highlight to us that, you know, nation states are interested in finding out what certain people are doing. One way to track what's happening and what's going on is tracking financial transactions. And people, you know, they may be interested in coming along and looking at your uh, information or hacking into your systems and exposing that information. In most cases, probably low risk, uh, and if you do become a, a target of those agencies, well, then it's, it's 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 a much bigger threat. But you know, where I would focus, though, will be on organised crime, uh, etc., uh, as being your prim your primary target. Uh, so, with that, Irvan, I'll uh, hand over to you to go through some of the uh, uh, data from the 2014 investigations report. Thank you, Brian. So for those of you who, who haven't seen the, the Verizon Data Breach Report, it's, it's really a fantastic report. It's now in its 11th year. Uh, the 2015 version is due out um, incredibly soon. Um, but basically what they're doing is they're looking at breaches over the last 10 years so far that they've been at it um, and seeing what and gathering some statistics and seeing where things are coming from, how things are happening um, in the industry. Um, but before we get into that, we're just going to do our next poll question. Um, so to the audience here, are you confident in the secure configuration of your POS devices? Um, simple yes or no answer, but uh, hearing all the kind of things that Brian's been talking about, um, are we confident that uh, our POS devices can actually be um, secure or not, or, or can an attacker get in similar to how they did with, uh, uh, with some of the breaches that, that Brian's talked about? So just a quick yes or no, um, and, and we'll keep going here. So looking at that, um, all right, just over half, so about 61% of you are, are confident in the secure configuration of your POS, POS devices. That's, that's a pretty good number. So taking a look at, the, at some of the statistics, um, we noticed that just, uh, just under a third of, uh, of the point of sale bre of breaches um, in the PCI space were around POS intrusion, 14% um, being, uh, being through card skimmers. Um, but what's even more interesting is of those uh, threat uh, vectors that that came through, the RAM scrapers uh, was ex exceedingly high uh, in the POS space. So um, being able to protect against those. So for those of you who, who were confident in your security, um, have you, you can ask yourself, have you actually seen some of this stuff? Have you picked up things like, uh, like RAM scraper information, um, detected um, exfiltration of data from POS systems, uh, brute forcing, things like that? So really, um, what we, want to, what we want to take a look at is, is the time to detection. And one of the first questions was, how quickly can, can we detect? Um, well, if you take a look, um, compromise uh, for POS intrusions uh, over half the time, or just about half the time, has taken just seconds. Um, once you're within minutes, you're well over 80% um, of compromises. Then the exfiltration of data is within minutes. So if they're in within seconds and minutes, um, they're exfiltrating within minutes, but the time to discovery has been weeks. So that's a lot of time uh, for an attacker to come in and, and pull out information from, from your PCI environment. Um, the even more astonishing statistic is that over 99%, uh, almost all um, of breaches uh, were detected from an external source. So imagine having a customer come up to you or law enforcement coming up to you and saying, hey, you've been breached, you need to fix it. And, and this is weeks after the breach. Yes, so thanks, Dr. Ervan. And actually, one of the things uh, we find in uh, our research is that very often when we contact a company that has a security breach, where the, the, the first time they know about it is when we contact them. So uh, um, it's, it's worrying that many companies don't know they've, they've a security breach until somebody externally tells them about it. So what we want to do now is just focus maybe on PCI DFS 3.0. And just talk about what the standard could mean uh, to, to to you, and, and maybe some of the things you can be doing to to, to deal with it. So PCI has been developed by 
Visa, MasterCard, Amex, and other credit card um, companies to help reduce the uh, amount of credit card fraud, uh, uh, particularly those caused by security breaches uh, on, on the electronic side. You know, uh, now it does apply to any company that uh, stores or processes credit card data, um, I, I, and it, it not just applies to. Uh, IT systems, if companies take credit card data over the counter, over the phone, uh, etc., uh, uh, they have to compl be compliant as well. And I often find um, when I'm dealing with some clients, they think PCI is just on their IT system or their online payments. No, it, 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 it's your credit card data, uh, wh wh whatever it is, you know. Uh, so, so uh, there are different levels if you're a different organization, uh, different types of, of merchants go from level one to, to level four. So, uh, for example, if you do more than six million transactions annually, you need an independent assessment by a, a qualified security assessor from PCI. Uh, less than that, it's, it's a self-assessment questionnaire, and the intensity of the questionnaire uh, varies depending on the number of transactions you do. Uh, if you're not compliant with it, uh, you, you can have Fines defined by each payment brand. Now the fines will be against your acquiring bank, and then they, no doubt, will pass their fine on, on to you if necessary. You could be fined up to five euros per compromised card. Uh, you could also end up with increased transaction costs. So the credit card companies may up your uh, the, the percentage they charge you on processing credit cards as well, or even. Uh, uh, suspension of the merchant account, or in some cases of major uh, breaches, may automatically put you at the same level of requirements you need uh, as a level one merchant, even though you may not be hitting those uh, uh, six million transactions. Uh, and uh, you know, being based in Europe as well, don't forget there may be other potential fines and problems you can have. You stay sure insurance, for example, as we talked about earlier on, got fined by the uh, UK data protection. Data Protection, protection uh, Commission, uh, Data Protection Office, the Information Commissioner's Office. Uh, so uh, th th there's potential there as well, and there may also be regular, regulatory uh, fines as well. So taking that into account, think about your own credit card data, and let's figure out how secure is your cardholder data. And you know, very often when we think about security controls, and this is one of the reasons we were doing some of the polls earlier on, is have a think about what your controls are. We, we, we put something in place to think, yes, that is now secure. But if you have a look at that, that uh, picture there on, on, on the screen, we have a barrier across the road. Yes, the entrance to and from up and down that road can now be controlled by that barrier. But unfortunately, there's no complementary controls around the barrier. So as you can see from the, the, the tracks and the, the snow, people can drive around the barrier because there's no fence or any other way to, to, to make sure that that control can work. So it's important to ensure that whatever controls you've got in place, that you're continuously monitoring them and you're continuously ensuring that, 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 that they can work. And the way to do that is how to protect, how do we, we secure systems. We have talked about the tougher areas of uh, uh, PCI uh, and how your strategy you can put in place to, to look at that. And Irvine will go through uh, some of the, the requirements you need with PCI uh, as well. Yeah, and, and Brian, you mentioned a great point there. And it, it's difficult. It's not necessarily easy. And I've worked with a lot of these companies. And, and yeah, it's easy to get, um, or may or may not be easy necessarily, but you, you will get uh, go through that self-questionnaire, um, go through your QSA, your auditor, and, and get a check mark and pass your audit. But, but maintaining these configurations is really the key, being able to, to ensure compliance stays not only just during the audit, but throughout the year. Um, and these are areas most organizations need to address or have, or have, have to really work hard at staying current. Um, so let's jump into some of these topics. So, yeah. First off, uh, identifying and valuing key oh, sorry. assets. Sorry. Okay, right. <laughs> Bit of a lag there. My apologies for that. Um, uh, yeah, so the first thing to do is identify your key assets. Now, of course, being PCI, the focus is on your credit card data. But what we need to do is figure out where is that, where is that credit card data? What's it stored on? Is it on servers? Is it on uh, uh, Desktops? Is it on uh, laptops? Is it stored in the cloud? Uh, where, where, where is it? Uh, and you know, 
when you look at that data and identify where it is, well, then you need to decide, should, should it belong there? Uh, are the security controls appropriate or, or adequate to ensure that you can meet the requirements from PCI and to keep that data secure? Uh, so, you know, once you do your interview, don't stop after us. Uh, rank your data in, in, in its importance, and uh, I suppose do do a, an, a proper risk assessment of uh, whether or not you should have your data stored in the cloud. And, and that's something I see with my customers all the time, um, really, because you can't protect what you don't know. So if you don't know what's out there, if you don't know what value it is in your environment, um, how are you supposed to protect it? Um, and that's where, where the PCI requirement comes in um, for data flow uh, and network diagrams uh, being merged together. Um, and this is really, really a big challenge for, for a lot of organizations um, because being able to first identify, okay, what's everything and how do we ensure it's not, that's not changing or how do we know that when it is changing, we are kept up to date. Um, and secondly, being able to add in um, cardholder data flow to this map. Um, and that's something that organizations are going to have to do with, with, with 3.0. Um, and it's really not something that's, that's as easy, but it's something that definitely needs to be done. Yeah, and I've, I've seen that if I'm from uh, work with a lot of my clients, you, you find the perimeter security is quite good. Uh, but once you get, you know, it's the old phrase, it's, it's uh, M&M security, all, all nice and uh, crunchy and, and hard on the outside, but once you get inside, it's a soft, gooey uh, uh, inside, uh, just like the chocolate inside in, a, in, a, in, a, in an M&M. M &M. But uh, and a lot of that has been down to, you know, that we have networks that have evolved over decades, so going from the mainframe-based environment back from the 60s and 70s uh, to, to where, where we are now, that you have networks have evolved, uh, companies have been, uh, you know, they may be buying other companies, they may be merging with other companies, they may be divesting assets off. So you, your network is not, you know, it, it can be difficult to segment, but it is, it is important that you do look at where your networks are and how you can segment your networks and uh, see, see where you can, you, 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 you can, you can keep your, 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 your systems there. And the other problem is as well that we have is that many companies have silos. Uh, you've got operations looking after one thing. You may have network security at another thing. You may have uh, an IT department in a specialist business unit somewhere else. You may have applications looking at stuff. And the knowledge are, is not enterprise wide, and, and it's getting that nice across from the enterprise is is hard, you know. So, as some organizations are doing is that they try and simplify their cardholder data environment uh, to bring it down to, to these diagrams. You can have automated tools to go out and map the environment to try and look at, at, at what's out, out in there. Maybe simulate some different types of network traffic across your environment so you can see what points are touched on the uh, on the network. Uh, and very often you might just you know, discover that your uh, assumption about how your network works may, may, may change. Um, and, uh, you know, so it, these things it, it, it can, can happen as well. You know, it's, it's how it happens as well. And, and that's really key also for, for some of the other points as well, um, knowing how the network's laid out and, and where things are so you can see where, where points of breach could happen. Yeah, and uh, you know, some of the tools you can use uh, as well as for different trip bar, but look at your DNS servers, you look at your DHCP servers, uh, that can help you see what devices are connecting or not to your network and from where they're connecting as well. So there, there, there's quite a lot of... Uh, 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 resources that you can use to, to help on this. Key to it all as well, of course, is, is, is doing a, an effective risk assessment. Uh, so you've identified where your data is, uh, where your credit card data is. You, you've, you've evaluated, you've looked at your network segmentation, your data, data flows. Now you have a good idea of the what you're facing, and that now you can do a, a good risk assessment. Figure out what are the key risks against the data as to what, you know, particularly from where it resides and where it lies. And uh, then you can look at, well, do we avoid it? You know, let's not store our credit card data on that system or on that provider or that third-party vendor anymore. So we avoid the risk by uh, that way. Or we can reduce it. Let's put in additional controls. Uh, let's make sure that we have the right controls in place. Or you could actually transfer it. So you know, the opposite to avoid, you could transfer it 
maybe there's there are third party vendors that specialize in certain aspects uh you know maybe such as customer support or uh security monitoring or other items that would provide value to 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 your business and you can transfer that out to uh, uh to 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 other parties as well Yeah, and, and network segmentation testing. So this is really key. If you if you go back to uh, some of the breaches that happened, um, like Sony, for example, having a flat network. Um, when when networks are designed with that security in mind, um, yeah, they're very convenient. You can get from point A to point B, no problem. Uh, but the problem is, so can uh, so can attackers. So having your PCI seg environment segmented, having organized different areas within the network segmented. Um, are really key uh, as it'll it'll block things off from getting from point A to point B. Um, otherwise, you could have one section of your uh, your network compromised um, and leverage uh, and leverage that compromised system to, to infiltrate the rest of the network. Um, and coming in there as well is uh, is penetration testing. Um, so for for level one merchants, obviously you you would get a, a QSA to come in one once a year and and get that penetration test going. Um, but the other piece is uh, for, for organizations that need to do this in an automated fashion. Um, and this is something I see all the time where, where organizations are like, hey, we, we bought a penetration testing tool, uh, but it's really noisy on my network. It takes stuff down. Um, well, from an ongoing perspective, if, if you're doing vulnerability scanning uh, on a regular basis, um, you're able to see how your risk um, is, is trending um, as, as your users are patching and things like that. Uh, but the next piece is you can, instead of using a, 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 a tool that penetrates your entire environment on a regular basis, um, you can get something like a, like a core impact or a core, sorry, a core insight um, that actually monitors uh, and, and maps how an attacker would get into your network. So you can say um, it'll take all the data from your various security tools and say um, if an attacker is going to come in from here, how does it get to um, how is it going to get into my cardholder environment or, or some of my other environments? And really being able to map that and see it in a visual has been really key for, for a lot of my customers. Um, Brian, what, what do you sort of see in, in the pen testing world? Yeah, I see, I see similar challenges as well. Uh, is, uh, and, and sometimes what, what I see, unfortunately, is uh, clients engaging with pen tests, either external parties or doing it internally, simply as a a compliance checklist. Oh, we've got pen test done. Bang. We, we you know, we, we we can satisfy the auditors or the the, the 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 QSAs. But really, you know, a pen test is like a quality assurance check. It's it, it is a type of audit, and it's much better for you to to, to do a pen test in a, in a uh, a more proactive uh, role way to, to to identify where the key weaknesses are in your environment so that you can uh, be better protect it. So uh, uh, you know, I suppose it is make sure you, you're buying the right tools and engaging with the right companies to do that as well. Yeah, for sure. And, and making sure that it's not just a, a checkbox for, for not only this this section, but the rest of the compliance policy as well. Uh, being able to ensure oh, that indeed, it's yeah. in fact uh, yeah, a security feature, exactly. Um, so one of the next um, key points in, in 3.0 is, is inventorying all your wireless access points. And, and one of the key things here is that it's, it's all the access points, not just the ones in, in the PCI environment. Um, we had, uh, we had a, a proof of concept we did not too long ago where, where we were discovering some assets on a network, um, and we found that somebody had a, a wireless, just a home wireless router, plugged in under their desk. Um, I mean, there, there was an environment where everything was hardwired, so you would think that, that this this requirement wouldn't wouldn't matter. But uh, someone just, you know, for for sure convenience, plug in a router under their desk. <laughs> so being able to detect that, it goes back to having your network diagrammed, um, doing network discovery, um, identifying what's on your network. Because again, you can't protect what you don't know. So making sure you have an inventory um, of all of your wireless access points is, is really going to be key. Um, so doing that discovery across the network. Um, and then every one of yeah, them no, you have a business justification. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, you're, abs you're absolutely right there, Ivan, as well, because I, I've there were one client as well who were uh, located in a listed building and they uh, wanted to extend their staff, you know, convert their storeroom into a, in, into office space for some staff, but uh, it was taking quite an amount of time to get permissions from the city council to to, to modify the building to, to allow to do that. 
uh, and variety to drill holes through the walls and to route cables to, um, to, to, to the desk, etc. So the business manager of that area got so frustrated, he went down to the local computer store with his own credit card, bought a, a, a wireless access point, came back, plugged into the company's network, and uh, he was a hero to all his staff because now they could all connect to the, to the network wirelessly. But obviously from a security risk point of view is that uh, unlike wired networks, wireless transmissions can can travel outside your building and uh, particularly if it's an unauthorized wireless access point where the person setting up may not be IT savvy or security savvy, you could end up with a, an insecure device uh, allowing access onto your network as well. So uh, it, it's it, you know it, it's it's important to have have an entry of where where access points are and to identify any particular uh, uh, unauthorized ones. Yeah, and, and frustration definitely uh, is a justification, but I don't think uh, for the PCI world that's a valid uh, business justification. <laughs> no. <laughs> so uh, really the key here is, is once you know what's on your network, um, once you know uh, how, how things are going, where your risk posture is, the key is being able to monitor and respond to this over time. Um, you know, when I was working at, at various organizations and, and with various, various organizations, it tends to be a fire drill when, when audit rolls around. Um, and if we're not getting audited every other week, uh, our compliance starts to slip. Um, and not just compliance, but the security piece of that tends to slip. So really being able to, to monitor uh, your assets, monitoring for changes, monitoring for risk, monitoring for, for what changed on your network diagram um, is really key. And being able to respond to that. And many of you did say that, that you're able to respond to a breach within 24 hours. Um, but how do you respond to uh, uh, an indicator of risk, like uh, patching, for example? Um, some of the key examples that, that Brian mentioned earlier, um, they're compromised through outdated software. Um, you know, if, if, if it takes us, if a patch comes out, a critical patch comes out, and it takes us a month and a half to test and, and three months to implement, uh, we're only patching once a quarter, and that gives an attacker three months to get in. Uh, but not only um, new patches, how are we doing with, with older patches? Um, there's a statistic not too long ago where where majority of these breaches are, are, taking, are taking place um, through attack vectors that have been out for, for many years or months or years or lots of time. So really being able to ensure that you're up to date with your systems and, and making sure you, you are in fact checking not only for, for new patches but older vulnerabilities as well um, and, and closing those risks off. Um, now, the next piece here is, is the user access roles and business justifications. Again, going back to uh, vendor management and, and users uh, doing things that they're not supposed to. So again, some of those breaches that Brian talked about, um, we had uh, the HVAC account, uh, the HVAC user account uh, compromised, and they ended up being able to get into the PCI environment. Um, so I mean, that's obviously not using least privilege, um, because uh, they shouldn't necessarily need to get into that environment on a regular basis. Um, interesting statistic, the, the Ponemon um, Institute found that only 34% of retailers are actually measuring access and authentication violations. So anytime an, an employee leaves, uh, an employee changes roles, uh, these types of things need to be um, up to date, kept up to date. And having your, your identity access management program up to date is, is really going to be key here. Um, and it does get more complicated because it's not just your end users, but system administrators, network administrators, third parties, um, and anyone that, that may or should not um, have access to your cardholder data environment. So you want to make sure that that's all, all segmented off. And of course, those who do have access to it, um, you have a valid business justification. Um, the role is clearly defined, um, and, and they have the appropriate resources to do their role um, and nothing more. Uh, yeah, and I think that, that leads nicely on as well, Irvine, to the whole area of security awareness training. Uh, it's all well and good having technical controls in place, but uh, you know anybody from, who's worked with technology knows that they can fail, they can be misconfigured. Uh, they're not 100% guaranteed. Yes, they are very important, but we need the additional layer of making sure staff are aware of what they should be doing, how they should handle credit card data, where how, you know. Why are these controls in place so they can understand that they're not there to block them from working? They're there to help them uh, help them uh, do work. And some of the key statistics are, 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 are I've come across before is that IBM in in, in their recent uh, uh, 
uh, report on breaches that they've dealt with said that 98, 95% of breaches were due to human error. And that's, that's a huge, uh, uh, you know, if, you think, take, if, if, if we could take humans out of our uh, systems, we'd probably have them much more secure. But we, we do have to have people use it. So, um, uh, 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 you know, it, it's there. Semantic themselves have said 90% of malware requires some human interaction. And Mandiant, in, in the breaches they've worked on, the human being has been involved in 100% of them. And that could be a spear phishing email, uh, a drive-by download, or, or some way that, that, that that's happened. And yet, from Ernst and Young have stated that 65% of organizations see security awareness as a challenge. And, uh, you know, I see that as a challenge myself with a lot of my clients as they, again, similar to the pen testing environment, they see it as a, it's, it's a compliance evil necessity and uh, a tick box to be done. And that, let's just throw some PowerPoint slides together, send them out to the users once a year, and that will keep a, satisfy the, the regulators. But again, we're not trying to satisfy regulators. Compliance is, is, is one aspect of what we're looking at. But keeping things secure is, is more important, and uh, a byproduct of being secure will be, uh, uh, be being compliant. And, uh, uh, you know, that's, that, that, that is why I can see, you know, the Open Security Foundation has solid three times of many breaches are caused by inside activity and malicious intent, so making sure people are properly trained and aware. So with that, I suppose it leads now to into the Next poll question, uh, do you have uh, security awareness training for your own employees? And the uh, simple answer to that is uh, yes or no. Uh, being sincere, you know, hopefully you all do and uh, carry them out regularly, but we'll, we'll see. And uh, great, you know, 77% uh, of you, you do, unfortunately 22% don't. Now do bear in mind with regards to PCI security awareness, Training is a requirement on the PCI, so it is something that you should have in place uh, anyway, uh, as that good security requires, but compliance PCI requires it as well. And then, you know, coming back to the target breaches, the um, uh, Staples breach, the Home Depot's breach, uh, and, and many other breaches as well, is that very often the that the source of the breach or the initial uh, factor of attack is through uh, a third party. So if you're dealing with third parties, how secure are, are they? Uh, how, what assurance have you got from your provider that they are meeting the requirements that you have in place for your own security? How, can you audit them? Have you audited them? Uh, uh, you know, are you able to carry out pen tests uh, against our systems, or have, have they given you access to third-party uh, pen tests, etc.? So do have a look at your supply chain and who their suppliers are. You know, like if you outsource to a provider, they outsource to another provider. Check in on that 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 that, that supply chain as well. Yeah, and that's great. So, so just coming up to, to the end of the presentation, if you've got any questions, please submit them uh, in the Q&A, and we'll be happy to, to address them. Um, but really, this is where, where uh, Brian and I, uh, from, from his company and, and Tripwire, where we can really help you guys out, um, really being able to um, provide uh, discovery on your network, uh, find out where your risks are, uh, figure out what's changing in, a, in an automated way, um, while providing business context to your organizations and to your to your stakeholders, because as Brian said, this is getting into into the executives. It is getting to the board of directors. So really, being able to provide business context um, is really one of the the key things um, these days. Um, of course, businesses aren't going to pay for what they uh, what they don't understand. So being able to translate security into um, into that business context and showing them how it affects their business uh, will really help you um, gain funding, um, gain traction, and, and be able to um, ensure that you're not only compliant but also secure. Um, and one of the key things we find um, in the organizations is that um, security can't work in silos anymore. Um, there's no one security company that you can go in, buy their product, and, and be secure. Um, you have to work with each other. Um, so really having that enterprise level integration uh, with your um, security ecosystem is key. So one vendor working with another. Um, and that's really uh, one of the key things you want to have uh, from all your security solutions, not just not just with Tripwire. Um, so some of the resources we have, um, so if you could check out our website, um, of course um, there's a hacking point of sale. Um, there's an exclusive chapter um, that you can get for free uh, on our website. 
Um, if you uh, if you want to try out uh, Vulnerability Scanner, we've got a free secure scan, uh, which is our full full blown cloud security scanner, uh, which is free up to 100 IPs. Um, so you can go in and, and try that out for your environment if you need as well. <coughs> Just reviewing some so of the key takeaways. Uh, yeah, sorry, Van, go ahead, sorry. <laughs> oh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, so reviewing the key takeaways, right, the key thing is, is understanding. So, so take, take heed to some of these scenarios. Um, best type of experience to learn is, is when someone else uh, falls, uh, help them back up, but you also learn from, from where they tripped and, and learn, learn how, to, how to do that. Um, taking a look at the cyber threat landscape, you know, those things that are not in the news, how do we stay out of the news? How do we stay out of the news not just by not having to disclose, but how do we stay out of the news by, by not getting breached? Um, and, and checking out some of those resources that, that we have. And of course, Brian and I, we're happy to help. Um, so moving on to, uh, to some of the questions that we have. Um, Brian, there's a couple here for you. Um, very interesting oh, one. <laughs> <laughs> what, what do people say when they first call for help? Uh, well, since it's still early in the morning, uh, I'll have to stick to the polite language, I suppose. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> Uh, to be quite, there's two things that are often said uh, to me is, what do we do? Um, and, and, and that comes down to a lot of companies not having their instant response plans uh, prepared. That they, the assumption is we have all the security in place, we're going to be fine. Uh, but you know, the, the worst time to try and develop an instant response plan is in the middle of an instant. So, um, is make sure you have your instant response plans up. You know, well. So, uh, um, and uh, uh, you know the different scenarios. And if, you, if you're looking for some good resources on that, ENISA, the European Network Information Security Agency, uh, that's ENISA.eu, E-N-I-S-A.eu. They have a whole section on search. They've got training material. They've got uh, uh, white papers on how to set up your incident response team, etc. And uh, SOCGEN, Society General, the, uh, the, the French bank, they have a great resource from their cert as well. So if you do a Google search for SOCGEN cert uh, scenarios, they have some uh, very good papers on different scenarios that they've shared with, with, with the community and, and, and how to work, work on this. Then the other question after you, 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 I'm asked what do we do next is how quickly can we be back up? Uh, so you know, once the shock is over and the, 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 the client is going, okay, we're dealing with this now, and can we get our systems back online? And very often that can jar with good uh, instant response because you want to take a forensic copy of the data. You may have law enforcement involved, so the timely thing. So I would recommend that when you're developing your instant response plans or if you have an instant response plan already to, to review it and tie it in with your business continuity plan so that if you need to keep the system down for a long period of time to facilitate an investigation that you can still carry on the business. So uh, that, that, that's what often the two, first two things, apart from all the choice language that I hear when uh, <laughs> clients ring me up. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Uh, so we have time for one more question. Um, and again, this one, this one was for you, Brian. Um, oh. what, what's the most common advice that you give uh, to your customers? What's the most common thing you see? Uh, the most common thing when, when, when we do security assessments of our clients, we go out and, and, and help them def define or, or, or review their, their security programs. Is that very often we find the technical aspects can be, you know, they can be relatively okay, uh, they may, uh, never nothing's ever perfect, but the human element is, is often overlooked, uh, and that includes training our staff how to use systems properly. It's uh, security awareness training, and it's not just for the people out in the uh, the business area, but also for uh, the IT staff and and, and and senior staff as well, who often are are, are targeted. So, um, uh, uh, yeah, uh, I suppose don't forget the human element in all this. Uh, just because it's tra it's bits and bytes we're dealing with, uh, the human element is still important. Attackers and criminals are writing malicious code not simply to target operating systems or applications, but to target people and to trick them into downloading uh, uh, malicious software onto your systems as well. All right. 
Thank you very much. So with that, uh, we'll hand it back to Melanie for, for some closing remarks. Thank you very much, Sherfan. Um, we've had a lot of questions coming in, um, and we will get back to everybody that has asked a question um, on, the, on the webcast today. So I'd like to thank our presenters, Brian Honan of BH Consulting and Irfan Kimji of Tripwire. And thank you to our audience as well today for joining us. We hope that you enjoyed the presentation. As I mentioned earlier, I will be sending out a link to the on-demand webcast and to the slides. We hope that you'll join us for future webcasts and do check out tripwire.com for future events. Also, be sure to check out our blog, State of Security. Thank you very much to everybody and have a great day.